Welcome to the uh, Citrus Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Ravi Nimana. Um, this uh, is webcast. This the series is webcast to all of our sister campuses. That would be um, uh, Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz. Um, it is my pleasure today to introduce our uh, services speaker. Um, it's uh, Jay Syramesh. Uh, who I'm told is formerly of IBM. Uh, we had him billed as from IBM, but that's okay. Uh, we won't hold it against you. Um, Ramesh is uh, currently a managing partner at 360 Fresh Inc. Uh, previously, he was a manager and program leader for the business solutions and manufacturing quality research at IBM Watson Research uh, in New York. Uh, he's one of the functional architects for IBM's e-business and e-marketplace, uh, including the uh, WebSphere uh, products. At IBM from 2001 to 2007, uh, he helped drive the vision and strategy for business solutions on value chain management, uh, warranty, and enterprise quality in manufacturing for IBM. Uh, he's also helped incubate and drive three commercial business solutions for IBM customers uh, in the area of uh, automotive, early warning systems, and supply chains. Um, he also holds uh, numerous U.S. patents and over uh, 50 research publications, which would make any junior faculty's um, eyes water. Um, he's won three Outstanding Innovation Awards um, uh, for his work in e-commerce and business solutions at IBM. Uh, please join me in welcoming um, uh, Jay Syramesh to our Distinguished Speaker Series. His lecture today will be on uh, service systems and value networks, uh, business case studies, models, and design principles. Thank you, Rich. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, I should also add, uh, at, for those who are uh, watching this remotely, you are welcome to provide your email, uh, sorry, your comments and questions via instant messaging, and Travis Richardson will field them toward the end of the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi. Thanks very much. Um, just want to verify if the mic is too strong. Or, or is it? it's, okay, it's good? Okay. I'll try and speak softly. So it'll be softer. Anyway, thanks once again. Um, what I want to do is, given the amount of time, I'll try and spend the first half an hour covering some of the new areas of research that we kicked off about three or four years back. That is when I was in IBM till two weeks back. And, and now, actually, I'm sort of consulting independently but focusing also on the similar issues, taking them into manufacturing, into potentially healthcare, and other areas as well. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk about some case studies, talk about some design principles, talk about actually what are interesting open challenges, and make it more of an open discussion as well. If you have any questions at any time, please do let me know. And this is joint work with colleagues at IBM Research, you know, my ex-team, uh, a lot of uh, professors actually in Europe, because this topic is of interest to a lot of people in Europe. Um, and also I'm a member of the uh, European Industry Consortium for Services Research, where a lot of industry and faculty come together to do research and at the same time define projects. Um, so this is joint collaboration with them. Let me just uh, go through a few things quickly, just in terms of my background. You've already heard it from Ravi, I won't go into details. But I think one of the most important things I want to talk about is that we were actually very interested in, in the last four or five years on early warning systems. Is every large business or every small business always has to have some indicators that tell them that something is going wrong or going right. And if things are going wrong, how bad is it? Can we predict the future risk? Can we actually take actions based on those? But then where do you get the information from? How do you mine the information? How do you collect the information? Do you have to have sensors within your Enterprise, when I mean sensor, I don't mean actually physical sensors, but actually software sensors that measure you know, how well are my sales doing, how are my products doing, how many consumers have complained. Or do I have to go deep into the supply chain and find out if there's something wrong happening in the supply chain? Okay, so these are the kind of problems you're looking at. Really speaking, what really is happening is the enterprises now are really dependent on their partners for selling, for sales, and so on and so forth, on their partners, on the supply chain, and their partners for doing production. So all of a sudden, enterprise becomes an, a brand center with everything else around it loosely coupled in an ecosystem, and you have to depend on them for all of your products, all of your production, all of your manufacturing, design, and, uh, and eventually service. So that's where we really started getting into it. And currently, I'm basically consulting on my own. That's why I call myself a managing partner. Uh, but basically, I'm doing my own independent consulting with IBM itself. Uh, and with other companies as well, which is how do you get also internet to play a role in connecting your ecosystem of participants. So if I'm a large company, I'm going to use the internet more and more in the future to connect to my suppliers, to connect to my 
uh, dealerships, to connect to my partners, and I can share information, I can use that information effectively, and also use the internet as a way to do my early warnings. Because nowadays consumers don't just complain on, on call centers, they also go complain on discussion boards. And sometimes the early warning can come from there. And so we're trying to see how those channels can change the way you manage your company and manage your enterprise. So I've already sort of covered this in, in a certain way, where I'll give an example of IBM. IBM actually um, pretty much produced every nut and bolt uh, for all of their huge servers, the huge backend servers and their machines as well. And of course, not, lately, the laptops are not being produced by IBM, produced by the Chinese company, Lenovo. But still, IBM built everything on their own. And over the last 10, 15 years, that shifted from 90% in-house production to 5% in-house production, which means that they pretty much get everything from the outside world, including the manufacturing is done by contract manufacturers. So they have a huge ecosystem of suppliers, multiple tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, and a huge ecosystem of also uh, sales and dealerships through which they sell, and partners who actually manufacture for them. Well, what happens is that if something goes wrong somewhere, how do you actually find out what went wrong? Whom do you blame? Who's responsible? And so at one point, IBM started losing lots of money in payouts in the form of warranty, form of obviously, uh, you know, field, um, field reports actually told them that something is wrong, so they'd pay out the field engineers, and tons of warranty, somewhere in the order of close to uh, a billion, a 1.5 billion to 2 billion you know, per, per year. Obviously that reduced now dramatically because they changed the policies, changed the way they actually monitored the whole supply chain. Go ahead, and question. So do you have a contract with your suppliers in terms of how warranty costs can be the, they, they probably have contracts on how they actually purchase these things and ensure some, uh, some specification. Yeah. But when you actually put all these things together, yeah. which include, for example, these huge servers are basically as size of the cars. They're quite big. They contain embedded software, they contain electronic components, nuts and bolts, capacitors from all different suppliers. Somebody has to do, do the integration, somebody has to test them, and it's typically done by IBM or done by third-party contract manufacturers. Once you find something is wrong, what evidence do you have to prove that actually it's that supplier? Unless you actually go down into detail. And so they discover that unless they maintain a whole sensing system in the supply chain, multiple tiers, only then they can figure out, that, oh yes, that's capacitor that's sold by the supplier actually caused the issue. So they have to identify who's responsible. And sometimes it could be the responsibility of the designer inside IBM, or it could be the responsibility of the engineer within IBM, or it could be somebody doing it into testing of the system as well. So you'd never know exactly what's going on. So the whole life cycle of the product has to be looked at. Because more and more, it's not just the fact that you purchase a part from a supplier and then you put together your, your computer or your, or your server, in fact, they participate in the design of your product. They play a role up, from, up front, which is also a big, huge shift. So it's not, it's not that I do the design and I do my engineering and my prototyping and then I'll go and mass produce by purchasing all the parts. I'm actually going to get my suppliers to play a big role up front, which means that over the next 10 years, innovation is going to move actually surprisingly from the manufacturer side into the supply side. They will build all the big components, they'll build things, and all the magic will just, just put them together. And so the question is, who's responsible? Is it the designer? Is it the manufacturer? Is it the manufacturing process? Is it the, the way you purchase? A lot of interesting things come up. And we worked with a few interesting clients where problems could come up anywhere. Could come up anywhere. It's amazing. And every time you begin your mass production, introducing risk in the whole process. And you want to find a way to reduce that risk right from the beginning. Sometimes you do your risk analysis five years before you mass produce. Because five years before you mass produce, you figure out, okay, I want to have these features, I want to have all these nice specification, I'm going to get from these suppliers. But the moment you select your process, you're already using risk into your system. And the goal is to reduce that risk as you progress towards your mass production date. So it's very interesting the way things are being done. So you measure everything from what's the internal cost of quality, uh, the cost of warranty, the leakage, What's the risk of introducing every single part? And you look at the past history as well of the, both the supplier scorecard and look at the parts and so on and so forth. So that's why I was mentioning that, that businesses are beginning to see the need to have the sensing network. When I mean sensing, I don't mean a physical sensor. I meant actually a sensing system that covers and spans 
your production, your pre-production, your design, your post-production, your service, and so on and so forth. Every signal that comes in can make a difference. So that's why we, we, we call this actually service value networks because it's not just the fact that they're all connected in an ecosystem. The way they share knowledge about the way they produce components, the way they sell components, buy components, where they put them together, is all knowledge that has to be shared somehow in a nice way. Why? Because if something goes wrong, how do you do root cause analysis? How do you actually identify what went wrong? How do you actually identify who's responsible? How do you compute the cost and so on and so forth? It's very complicated. I'll give interesting examples of this kind of thing. So basically what I'm saying is that networks are being formed and value is being shared in form of knowledge in terms of physical and regular knowledge of goods. But the question is, is how do you actually monitor the networks? How do you ensure that things are actually going fine? So we call them service value networks because there's an interdependency between uh, every supplier, every manufacturer with the dealerships, every manufacturer with their partners, and so on and so forth. The dependency actually has a big impact in how you actually provide services to the end consumer. So we call the service value network as sort of uh, a network of, of, of services that form very complex chains, and they share value back and forth. I'll give an example. In fact, I'm going to give an example right now. Uh, it's coming actually not from the two case studies here, but it's going to come from the automotive industry. Example is that you, know, you have a brand new car, and you discover that actually that brand new car is, is um, got a half a million to two million lines of software running in there, and it's just two months old. You take it to dealership because something is wrong, and the dealership has to figure out what went wrong. Imagine them debugging a, a car that has 50 processors and about two million lines of software, and something is wrong, they really have to f do a lot. All this diagnosis and so on and so forth. So what they do is basically, they have a book of symptoms, or they call up an expert in the manufacturing company, or they call up somebody else who actually knows how to solve this problem. So they have to start sharing knowledge between the dealerships, and between dealerships and the manufacturer. Uh, in fact, manufacturers have experts sitting on the bench waiting to make sure that a lot of these brand new cars, if they have any issues, they quickly take action on it. Because obviously it's going to hurt their reputation, it's going to hurt their sales, it's going to hurt their you know, brand image and so on and so forth. So if you look at it, uh, a dealership, it really has to partner now very closely with the manufacturer and vice versa. Also with other dealerships, because if they have seen similar issues on a brand new model, they can actually share information quickly. That information can help you reduce the repair time. In the end, the consumer is going to complain if the car doesn't get repaired in time, number one. Number two, actually, if it doesn't get repaired with the right things in place, which means that sometimes you, you, you think you've actually repaired it, but you'll be back again in a, in a week or two. So the correctness of repair and the fast, you know, the, the repair time, improved repair time is very important. So what happens is that dealerships now have to, when they get the car, they look up information. They have to look at the car information. So somebody has to give them information about the specification. That information could be coming from a third-party company that has says contracted from the manufacturer the whole catalog of that particular car. So now I have an ecosystem being formed where you have somebody who owns the content for the car, somebody actually who can fix the problem for the car, somebody who's got knowledge about the car because you have transmissions, you have ignitions, you have processing, you have electronics, and so on and so forth. So there has to be this sort of this knowledge network of people and information that has to quickly come to the right place at the right time only then your car is going to be fixed. So gone are the days where if you have a mechanical failure and something goes wrong and a car stops, you can actually go and find the failure quickly. Now when you have software failures, electronic failures, it's much harder. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned earlier that before a new product is ready to be put together, yeah. the design phase, you have to go through the risks involved. Yes. Do you have any tools or any technique to use? I was actually going to show that. So for people on the web um, who are actually uh, remote, uh, the question is, are there formal tools that can actually analyze risk um, way before you begin mass production? Are these tools looking at what happens before design, what happens before production, what happens after production? Okay, so the, that's the question. The answer is yes. Um, in fact, we just came out of a big engagement um, with, with a big client of ours, when I was in IBM, where we spent almost 18 months building risk management tools to analyze the risk of the pre-production of cars before they actually become you know, fully produced. Because you actually have issues uh, on everything from 
Are the processes being followed properly? Are the parts being procured properly? In fact, are the suppliers actually being tested properly? Uh, is the testing going on fine? Because they spend lots of money doing that. And if they don't meet their quality gates, they don't actually mass produce these cars. And the same thing can apply to pretty much any industry. You have to have these well-defined business processes and measurement techniques that measure everything that happens before the day you begin a mass production. Because once you mass produce, you actually are selling things out into the market. And you already made a mistake. And some people have said, you actually made a mistake the day you design. <laughs> so the day you design, you actually have introduced a lot of mistakes that you don't know about. So in fact, they want to do risk analysis before they design. And the risk is now not just risk based on, I want to add this nice new feature to this VCR or nice new feature to a car. It's actually a risk based on um, having the right features that match the consumer demand and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's, it's, it's fairly interesting how this is done. So there are interesting case studies where you have to depend on your network whether you're doing design, which is collaborative design, or if you're sourcing material from your supply, supply base. And in the past, your suppliers tend to be within a few areas of, of the world. Now, the supply base is all over the world. How do you know a certain supplier actually is stable? Not just stable in terms of the process, but also financially stable. If I've actually procured from a supplier, and I know in two, two three years they can actually go down, if I know that, then I shouldn't be procuring, even though they might be the best. So they're all kind of interesting, you know, uh, criteria and, 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 and analysis become part of it, actually, okay, so it's one of the biggest things. Let me go into the other part of it. Uh, I think I already covered this to a certain extent, which is, um, as I mentioned, innovation is going to be moving down into the, into the supply base. And this chart here, um, I actually took it from one of the analyst reports, which actually very clearly shows how, in 2002, you depended 65% of your parts from a supplier, supply base, in the future, it's going to be close to 80%. This is from the automotive industry. You pick any industry, you'll have this kind of a distribution. And what's really saying is that innovation is moving um, from the manufacturing side into the supply side, and they will end up building all of these big components and subsystems and actually will have to work together. So let me go to one of the case studies, and I think I already covered this to a certain extent. This is a case study of IBM. How IBM transformed itself uh, from a purely internal manufacturing with very minimal sensing and, and quality analysis to a more distributed ecosystem of, of, of suppliers and partners with distributed monitoring and measurement. Okay. And so this, this was one of the things that actually uh, is, is all used as a case study in, in, in pretty much a lot of the business schools of how actually if you go through every one of those things, they improved um, the, the quality dramatically. They were able to measure and identify which tier of suppliers actually caused the issues. They were actually able to improve the customer satisfaction by measuring customer performance and looking at you know, their feedback. So they sort of connected the consumer side, the customer side, to the supply side and had this whole system in place so they can keep track of things very closely. One of the biggest things is they're actually going to improve quality much faster. And what might take 200 days to fix, now probably takes 30 days to fix. So if you look at the cycle times, from the time they see an error and to the time they fix it, it could be 200 days. So every day they lose in trying to find what went wrong, they actually are introducing further defects into the system and they're selling the same things out into the market. So you, there are different different ways of trying to actually take the early warnings and stop production or stop some certain things or take action quickly. And that used to take a long time. Okay, this is just one of the case studies. Let me go to another case study. And I think I already covered this too, so next minute. This is, for example, the ecosystem of the dealer network I mentioned, where you have a dealer who basically is handling new cars and your new cars, you're getting the new cars, but then dealer has to follow about close to 10 major steps before he gives the car back to you. Okay, before he gives the car back to you. So what happens is that everything from when the consumer comes and drops the car off, they have to go through initial diagnostics. They identify the specification of the car. They have to pull information about the car. They have to identify what kind of symptom is actually happening. They have to make phone calls to the manufacturer and ask them for help, especially if it's a brand new car. They even have to call up suppliers and ask them, do you have the parts in place so actually we can get the parts replaced quickly. So they have to finish these 10 processes as quickly as possible and they had to share information as quickly as possible. Only then you get your car in time. This wasn't the case 20 years back. 
you took your car and manufactured sort of new, okay, this is a mechanical failure, okay, you know, they'll get, they have the part probably in place, so they probably call up somebody and quickly get it fixed. Now, they really have to go through very sophisticated information analysis. So if you go to a lot of those big companies like BMW and Volkswagen, they talk about how they're going to transform the whole dealer workspace, where every car has a diagnostic system next to it and a service bay. That whole thing is going to be connected to the internet as quickly as possible and connected to the manufacturer. So from there, I have this big screen TV where I can actually select what kind of model, pull the information out, look at symptoms, ask questions, collaborate with my uh, dealerships you know, in the neighboring county or even experts outside and get information and solve the problem quickly. So that level of sophistication requires very interesting ways of putting information together. So in this ecosystem, there are multiple participants that play a role. It's a dealership, the suppliers, the content providers who actually own the specification of the car, the manufacturers, experts within the manufacturers, even suppliers of the, of the manufacturers. So all of these you know, companies play a role. And how do you build and design systems that share the information between all these companies? So the better the collaboration, the better it is for them to fix cars. So how do you build that collaboration system? It's not easy. It's one of the toughest things. So what happens is that uh, I'm going to go into uh, uh, one more example. You have to build a system that actually has information and collaboration being shared between dealer experts, manufacturing experts, suppliers of supply parts, and expertise. Content providers have actually content of the car. And the people have to share information. Somehow the system has to be transparent and pervasive. It also has to satisfy the objectives. I want to repair the car quickly. I want information on fingertips. I want it to be accurate. I also want to maximize the engineer's time, because there are a lot of engineers sitting on the manufacturing side, but they're only catered to a certain number of dealerships at a time. So you have to optimize, in some sense, how you manage your workforce as well as a manufacturer. So end up looking at objectives of the dealership. They have to improve the repair time and keep the customer happy. The objective of the supplier is trying to supply parts and so on and so forth, and the objectives of the manufacturer. We're actually trying to figure out how to actually satisfy the dealership network as quickly as possible. Okay. And so that's basically what we call as dealer collaboration system, and I led the whole solution for this. It took a long time for us to build it, prove it, test it with, with companies, where the system actually is not sitting at just one place, it's sitting at three different places, interconnected. And you'd use, obviously, their web services and so on and so forth to get things going. But the eventual goal is to get the information and get the business metrics all to be monitored as quickly as possible and in place to get the collaboration going. And eventually, of course, you know, if you fix a car faster through the system, then this has been very useful for you. In reality, it is useful because they don't really have a system like this. They have a part system sitting somewhere else. They have a, a, a system for call center sitting somewhere else. They have information about the vehicle sitting somewhere else. So they have to look at five different systems at one place. Only then they make a decision. So, so the knowledge has to really permeate across these different businesses to really share information. So, uh, Go ahead. In, in terms of suppliers, then, uh, speaking okay. So suppliers, uh, when they initially have uh, negotiations with the manufacturer or the OEMs, um, do they have contract to the amount of information they need to provide or what is the rate at which? Because any misdiagnosis from the dealership is now going to be routed to them and they will be continuously annoyed with because they have nothing to do with it. So, uh, right, so what happens is that you, the, the way it works is, is the dealership gets the car. They would first find anything possible, uh, actually it's possible to fix the car. Because their goal is to keep the consumer happy. Because their, their customer service is very important for them. But they also know if they work more hours on the car, they get paid more. Because the manufacturer will actually be paying them for warranty, right? The, the, the cars are in warranty. But eventually the dealership is just simply going to write down saying, okay, this is a failure, this is a claim, and they will worry about it, it's just payment. The supplier doesn't even get to know anything at all. It's a manufacturer who has to look at all these claims coming for the same kind of car from multiple dealerships, for the same kind of symptom. They have to sit down, analyze it, identify it's an emerging issue, identify it's a big issue, there's a potential risk of losing money, and then they take action. So the manufacturer then have the supplier's knowledge that they hold into themselves yes. and now deal with the uh, dealers. Yes. And not necessarily the manufacturer has to now call the supplier. Not immediately. By the way, I, I don't know how to deal with it. You help me. Not immediately. 
not immediately. The, the, the assumption is that the assumption is that if, of course, you know, there have been cases where if there's an electronic failure, dealerships can't find out what, what went wrong. They call up the manufacturer. Manufacturer probably has experts in that area, or they have to call up the supplier. If the supplier, for example, is the Motorola, they're supplying electronic, you know, processors for the car, or could be a software component from any supplier worldwide, and there's a bug in the software that causes the doors to come open or you know windows to come down, whatever it is. It's been happened before. And in such situations, you have nothing much to do, but you have to basically call them up. And that causes, obviously, more delay in, in time. And it's happening now. It's, it's already happening as we speak. Maybe in a, just a few instances, but it's happening. It's a big deal. One more example here is, is totally different from the automotive industry. It's now on the pharma side. Again, I'm trying to give an example of a value network. Here, um, again, I'm talking about collaboration, why it's needed. So the important thing about trials in, in pharma networks is that you have to have um, clinical trials performed or preclinical trials performed in patients. So you have to get the hospitals together. You have to get experts together. You also have to get pharma companies that are producing the drug together. And you also have to get patients together. And this has to happen over a long period of time, testing. And right now, there's really no one system that gets people together. Only when you actually do this is sort of collaborative testing, you actually get to see if all of your drugs are working fine, all of the case rates are being you know, properly monitored, and so on and so forth. Right now, there's no system, uh, system actually in place, and how do you handle this? So what a lot of companies do is, is they actually send emails off, they make phone calls, they actually call them up, uh, they even send them um, manual you know, uh, questionnaires, asking questions. They send in information to hospitals. Hospitals put out information in some format. And, and eventually, things come together at some central point, let's say in an R&D lab or something like that, where the testing is done. And most of the time, a lot of money is spent, close to something like three to four billion per year, just doing this testing. A, because of lack of information. B, because of, of just because they don't have the right things in place. And C, the sharing process is very complicated. So here again is an example of how the collaboration between the hospitals, the experts, the pharma companies, small companies actually doing research, and the R&D companies have to work together to solve the issue. And eventually this issue will be that, yes, this drug actually works on these patients and everything is fine. So this whole process here is another example of how, where a simple collaboration system that connects people together and puts them together is very, very important to get things going. And again, you have interesting metrics. Metrics are how do you improve you know, the, the time to test? How do you improve the quality of test? How do you actually improve uh, the overall testing process? And this can take anywhere from one year to three years. How do you reduce the time? So like the way you're fixing your car, here you're fixing the, the process for testing. And you save time and money. And you'll be surprised at the system design. It's very similar. Another example here again. Now, these networks here, actually networks we've analyzed a lot over the last four or five years when I was in IBM. And we're still going to do more work on this in, in Europe. And part of the reason is because that uh, when you spoke to some of these companies, they said, this is going to take us 10 years before we build a system that connects all these people together. That actually will help reduce the cost of doing trials and therefore help reduce the cost of drugs and therefore help reduce the cost of a whole bunch of things. But to get this together requires a lot of interesting integration across multiple businesses. So like in the automotive case where you're fixing a car, you really have to get a lot of business together to fix the car. This is the situation right now. And it's going to change even more over the next 5 or 10 years. And it's quite interesting as to how things are coming together. So what I want to do is, is talk about, at a very high level, what are we trying to solve? Okay, and, and I just want to make, quickly do a time check. How much time do I have left? Um, 10 minutes? You've got, like, you, you got like 15, 20 minutes. And okay. We'll open up for questions. Excellent. So the, the first thing is, is what we call is how do you configure not just businesses, but actually services being offered by businesses. So you can look at this as a, a service network, where in the dealership case, it's the service of how you fix the car, the knowledge, right? the knowledge service is part of the service. Information about where the parts are, information about who actually has done it before. So the services networks are being formed in order to solve a problem, actually. In the pharmaceutical case, same thing. You're offering services about patient information, patient trials, uh, information of the drugs, expert knowledge, and so on and so forth. And so the question is, how do you design a system that minimizes the cost of services across 
this collaboration platform under certain constraints. You obviously have people, resources, and you have constraints on them. You have time resources and constraints on them, and overall information resources and constraints on them. So when you start designing the system, you have to look at all of these constraints together. Only then you can design the system. That's one of the most important things. Likewise, another big issue that came up was maximizing quality. So in the dealership case, if I didn't have the information available to me on my fingertips immediately, and if I made a, a mistake in actually diagnostics and made a mistake actually in fixing the car, what's going to happen is the car is going to come back again in about a week or two. And so the information has to be up to date and high quality. And you'll be surprised a lot of these manufacturing companies actually have close to something like 200% rate of increase of information per year. And it's growing dramatically. So they have to figure out which one actually is the most important part of the information that's needed to be a part of the overall analysis. And so um, I can go into details of what it means to actually form, formulate this as an interesting problem to solve mathematically. But let me go into an example, and that'll be. Uh, So before I go in, what we do is we go into modeling the environment of the business. So it's not just one business we're modeling. We're modeling actually multiple businesses, right? So if you look at what are the issues being faced by each business. So in the example of the car, the dealership wants to fix the car fast. The manufacturer actually wants to help the dealership so they can, they can fix the car fast. The, the suppliers want to give them information as quick as possible. So you have to have business issues and pains for every business, objectives for every business, and then eventually have stakeholders. So you have stakeholders from pretty much every company involved in one way or another. And you identify clearly what are the metrics to measure and what are the business processes that need to be looked at and improved and what are the issues in terms of technology. So we break down the network into these fundamental conceptual views of, of, of the environment of the business and go and identify clearly one by one what needs to get improved. Only then we begin the design. Okay. And here again, one can look at very interesting mathematical models. At the same time, this has to translate to a software system. You end up having to build a software system that gets information together, that ensures the metrics are properly measured, that ensures the processes are properly implemented. So that's the hardest part. Okay. So you can actually formulate very interesting problems here to solve, both mathematically and in software design sort of things. Some people call this business design, which is how you design the business itself to revolve around improving the repair of the time of the car, or it could be improve the clinical trials. So if I have a simple methodology here, which simply says that, well, let's, let's go through and analyze the network of business that work together, identify every metric, identify how you measure them, and what needs to get measured, and how often, and you follow a certain cycle. And we try to implement this cycle pretty much in every business. Because each business is going to implement their own view of the, of the overall design, but they at some point have to measure metrics that actually make sense. Okay. And here's an example of what we did uh, just in terms of mathematical models. I won't I spend too much time because it, it might be a little bit too detailed. Our goal eventually in any network of services is to measure. So the, let's say there's a network of, of, of 10 services. So there are 10 service elements or 10 businesses that actually sell, sell and buy and sell services. Each business actually has a certain value it offers. So somebody produces a service, somebody else consumes a service. And so there's a producer and consumer service and value being shared back and forth. In the repair of the car, for example, the dealership actually keeps information about the symptom that they've seen, well, when did the consumer complain, and what's the potential cause. That's very important information. They would then share the information with the experts or call the manufacturer and look, we have this big issue. So you share the knowledge, and somebody produces a service to help fix it which is their shared information and knowledge and expertise. So we talk about how can you measure what we call as the value that's being shared between businesses in a service network where somebody's producing it, somebody's consuming it. There's obviously revenue going back and forth. If the dealership fixes the car faster, they get paid for it. In the end, they actually get consumer satisfaction. But as I mentioned, if the dealership doesn't fix it faster, they actually get more money because the manufacturer might pay them more money but just because of the fact that it took them a while to fix things. It happens. It's sort of one of the things where you want to improve the metric of repair time, but working more on the car helps them because they get quarantine recovery from the manufacturers. Go ahead. So the answer is yes. You can use fuzzy concepts. You can. Um, 
it's a question of basically how you define it. Um, it's it's very, straight, very straightforward for the dealership. An example. All they care about is they need to fix the car fast, they need to buy the parts, replace the parts, and they spend two hours doing it. And they get paid for that. But in reality, if the symptom is very complicated, they don't want to do, it's up to them to take action, which is call up another dealership or make a phone call to the manufacturer and go through a process to get things fixed. That whole time period they spend fixing it, they're going to get paid for that. It could be 10 hours, could be 10 days, could be even, even, a, even a month in, in some cases. There have been cases uh, where actually you know, somebody complained that they have a software bug. It took them a long time to fix it. So the manufacturer now has to somehow keep the consumer happy, so they give them another car for them to drive around. At the same time, they find a way to fix it, because if they see it again, it's a big cost for them. So yes, there are some fuzzy, potential fuzzy modeling you can do, but it's again it's a question of what the symptom and so on and so forth. Okay. So the eventual goal is to measure what they call as a value for every service provider in the network. So there's a dealership, there's a supplier, there's a content provider, and there's a manufacturer. There are four of them. Each of them offers some value, and they get some revenue, they pay out some cost, and they see some interesting value. And this value measurements go into measuring the overall value of the network. The goal here is very simple. If the incentives of the service network are properly aligned, the dealership, the manufacturer, because they have the exper expertise in how to fix cars as well, and suppliers and so on and so forth, then this value will be maximized. Because I'm actually going to try and tie this up to customer satisfaction. I'm going to say that if the value here is maximized, I'm going to get the best uh, in terms of profit, I'm going to keep the consumers happy, and I'm going to improve the repair time. So it's a question of how you formulate the metrics and the, and the, and the overall objectives to solve the problem, actually. Okay? So these are the kind of things we're trying to look at to formulate these things. Eventually, we are, try to identify where should we improve the business process. Because when you solve this, eventually it tell you that, okay, we're spending too much time trying to do it this way. So a dealership you know, sees 20 cars per day. Each car has symptoms. They have to follow you know, step by step, so on and so forth. Maybe the process of doing that is not very good. Or maybe they're actually making phone calls at the end of the day, instead of making phone calls at the beginning of the day, or during the time, and so on and so forth. So actually, how you improve the process on the dealership side and on the manufacturing side is very important. And that will help you maximize you know, the value to the highest extent. So the overall design of the system is not just looking at the metrics, but also eventually how information is collected, the software design, and how information is being shared between, between businesses. So you'll be surprised, it took us almost uh, two years to build a solution like this for this particular repair case, and it took another two years to actually work it out with, with, with companies to show that actually it works. But if you look at it, it's because we're not able to get all the businesses to sit together and agree upon metrics, agree upon things. If they do, it'd be much faster. Up this as a uh, centralized problem. Here you bring all the par parties together in one objective, and you are thinking about optimizing. Right. Uh, that means there is a central controller who is going to implement all these pol policies that you come up with. Right. So, in fact, in some cases, the manufacturer is yeah. the central controller who actually says, "Hey, dealership, if you don't help me fix my consumer's cars faster." Yeah because you're not using the system in a, in a nice way, See. then I'm the only going to be blamed because I'm the brand manufacturer, yes. and my brand's image is going to get tarnished. But as a dealer, wouldn't I have my local objective that I would try to, as much as possible, yeah. implement and try to, it may be actually deviating much from the manufacturers. In fact, when you, we looked at dealerships and how they fix cars for a certain symptom, for the same symptom, for the same kind of model, we found an interesting distribution of costs. What this says is certain dealerships take their own sweet time to find what went wrong, and certain of them actually take, do it very quickly. And it's a double bell curve, which is exactly what I'm saying, is that some dealerships are actually very happy to take their own sweet time because they get paid for that. But in the process, when they do that, they're keeping the consumers waiting in the waiting line. So they had to play a subtle game of spending as much time as possible and still keep the waiting queue as small as possible. So they have to play that game because obviously dealerships have a fixed amount of capacity, of number of cars they can have per day. So uh, is, uh, therefore, a natural question is, does the manufacturer has any database in terms of that the consumers can access? For example, if a de uh, 
a particular dealer says, this is the problem with you, it's going to take me two days to fix it. But if the manufacturer actually has uh, where we can tap in and say for these type of problem, right. he's the distribution of repair time, and then we can make, a, as a consumer, make a judgment. In fact, it's, it's, it, that'll be actually fantastic, but they don't release that information because of the fact that it's maintained in warranty, and warranty is typically the lifeline of the service side of the business because the manufacturer is worried about that information. It has information about every failure, how much money you have spent, and which consumer, which car, and so on and so forth. So it's very private information. So that information somehow, if they, I don't know, in the future maybe, that's a good point. So the whole area of warranty analysis comes into play, yes. which is how do you actually identify what went wrong, and how do you fix it? So you're right, I mean, it's, it, it can be done. And the question is who's going to, it's a question of who's going to push the manufacturer to, to, to make that happen. Most of them are very worried about that information. In fact, even to work with them on a project would take us almost a year to get the uh, legal agreements in place just because that information is so important. Yeah. Because w one of the serious problems that I see in network service is that since e every one of them are going to have their local objective and they'll find the best possible way to deviate, right. does there exist a mechanism that one can set up so that they behave that is globally optimal than looking at local. Uh, that's a good optimal. point. Actually, in fact, uh, there could be, I think there could be interesting uh, auction mechanisms or something, like, something that actually yes. could bring incentives you know, in place, and, and that way they actually reveal the information much faster and better. And so there could be some, some things in place you can think of. Yes. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, I think there could be something. Uh, the reason, um, we actually thought about it more from a, the business side. Will there, can there be a central place where any consumer has an issue, they would take the car to a dealership, but they also would give the information to the central place. So dealership would learn from other consumers what's happening. So that central place has to be managed, has to be trusted, has to be approved by, obviously, the manufacturers, or somebody has to take responsibility for that. And maybe in the future it's going to happen. It might happen. And the question is, can you create that neutral, central, trusted place where information about every failure is captured? Now, you'll be surprised that the, the U.S. government um, did actually set up a database system. It's called NHTSA, NHTSA, that maintains uh, some complaints from consumers. And for every model, make your model of the vehicle, they actually have information about the failures. So not many people know about it because it's, it's, it's a, a site for regulation. But actually, if you go there, you can discover a lot of interesting issues that are being faced by manufacturers. This is being done for, I think, eventually cell phones, I think. They're going to do it also for other things, too. Let me go into another area, which is coming to your question now. As I mentioned, if you look at the life cycle of a product, you have the initial design engineering. Actually, in fact, you have marketing requirements, which is what makes sense to build. Then you have design engineering, then you have pre-production and, and engineering, then you have post-production and manufacturing, and then you have service. Typically, what happens is service is where you'll see failures. And information comes back from the service side. Consumers are complaining, or dealerships are complaining or something is happening somewhere outside and the information comes through blogs, through call centers, so on and so forth. How do you actually quickly identify what went wrong? So root cause analysis, different analysis, is very complicated because they look at early, we call them early warning systems. Because there are so many signals coming in. In fact, every day you could have something like failures from 10 different, of, of, of 10 different vehicle models and something like around 1,000 to 2,000 part failures. And we're talking of close to a million to two million records per day. How do you know, you know, among all these records, what actually makes sense to look at? How do you prioritize the top 10 failures? Do you look at cost? Or do you look at the failure count? Or do you look at, for example, severity? So let's say I'm driving a brand new BMW and something went wrong and the car stopped in the middle of the highway. So the consumer is very worried because this could cause a big accident, right? So the question is, how do you actually handle the information that's actually very specific to that particular car even though it just happened a few times, that information is of high value because it tells them that something is wrong in the design of the car. And more and more of this going, might happen in the future. That means it's going to be bad news. There's going to be a big accident and they're going to get sued. Versus, let's say, a tire failure or something, something small could happen a lot. Could be high-frequency failure, but it's really not that damaging. It's purely this cost. So if you look at cost, severity, criticality, consumer satisfaction, all variables into a failure and you analyze all of the signals, 
and then you put down your top 10 list of things you want to go after. Eventually, you identify if the failure is because of manufacturing, is because of engineering, because of design, and so on and so forth. So what happens is this, uh, which is coming back to the question of risk tools. Now, what will be nice is, can I learn from the past? Can I learn about all of the models I've designed in the last five years, so that when I design the new one, I've actually selected the right suppliers, I've selected the right design, I've done a good job, and eventually I've reduced my risk, so that in the future when I mass produce my cars, mass produce my products, I actually have less failures happening, because I've done a very thorough job of analyzing the past and, and learning from my mistakes. So that's, that's where this kind of interesting tools come in for risk analysis, where let's say, for example, on the, on the, on the x-axis this time, and the, the origin is basically the beginnings of doing what they call pre-production. I haven't produced a car yet. I've built a few prototypes. I'm testing them out. I purchased material from different suppliers. I also have history of all the parts that are going to be used because I've used them in the pro previous cars. Okay, that's starting from there. And what happens is as I'm testing it and I'm doing some initial building and so on and so forth, the costs are going to rise in the company. This is the cost of quality. So in the beginning when I do the design, it's on paper or maybe it's on a CAD tool. Then I take it into building prototypes. I might build like 50 prototypes, test it out. And as I'm building prototypes, I decide, okay, maybe I need to start doing some initial production of these things to see how they look like. So your costs are rising now. Now, now what happens is that as I'm doing my testing of these prototypes and initial production, I also want to make sure that I purchase the parts from the right supplier. So I'm going to have an army of 800 engineers who would make phone calls or go to the supplier site, look at their processes, look at all of their internals, come back and say, yes, this, process, this supplier is following the, the basic rules of Six Sigma. Okay? So your costs are going to rise. So your costs in the company are rising to a certain point where for every model that I produce, starting from the design phase up to I reach a point where I've finished my pre-production testing, costs are rising. Then at some point I'm going to say, okay, I've done my testing, I've reached my quality levels, I'm going to start mass, begin, begin to start mass production. So the costs are coming down. But the question is, once I decide to launch it, will the cost continue on into warranty? It's called the leakage. So a lot of companies want tools that analyze what happens even before design, what happens during design, what happens during engineering, what happens during pre-production, what happens during production, what happens post-production. They want to measure the risks of that particular model. Okay? So pick any, any manufacturer. It could be Nokia that's producing cell phones. They have five different models. Each model has its own supply base, has its own uh, manufacturing sort of lines. Likewise, for every car that's being produced, every model has one manufacturing line. And each line they have to measure people used in terms of validating the quality metrics. Suppliers are actually going to supply the parts, the line performance, and so on and so forth. So the costs are rising, and you measure those costs. In reality, in networks of this kind, every part that's being used is going to introduce risk. Every business process being used is going to introduce risk, and every supplier is going to introduce risk in the program. And when I made a program, I meant a brand new vehicle model that's going out that actually has brand new parts, and some of them are actually parts from the past programs, and they have a certain business process in place. Eventually, when the vehicles are launched at this particular point in time, this whole thing could be like about a year and a half, two years, this whole x-axis. You're measuring the cost. Eventually, the goal is to reduce the cost when you launch them out which means that there are no defects, or there are very few defects, and you know how to fix those defects. A lot of companies actually don't have a clue in terms of the cost in general. They have some measurements, but not very much. Obviously, they look at the financial balance sheets, so they know in some sense what they're spending, but where they're spending the money. So what will happen is that, let's say there are three curves. Okay, these curves are cost of quality curves. What happens before I launch? Then there's a cost of warranty, which is what I, what I spend after I find issues, right? So if you look at these three curves, what this means is that it could be the same business process, could be the same sort of suppliers, maybe even similar parts, but they're three different vehicle models. And if the variability between the models is quite large, then something is wrong. So the tools are being produced now to measure these curves, to predict the curves every month into the future months. So every time, every stage they go through from here to here to here, they want to know how this curve looks like. They also want to know what's going to happen after this date. Actually, they want to know what happens after this date, given that actually they're here. Given that they're here. Given that they're here. 
So they want to measure the risk of the, of the launch, risk of, of, of launching these things at every stage of their production cycle, every stage of design. So they call these curves actually the risk curves to estimate the risk. Only then you do actual design. In the process, they also keep track of the network of suppliers. They want to tell them, look, you know, we've identified that out of these 2,000 parts that are going into this brand new vehicle, 10% of them are high risk parts. And this is the reason why. And so there are all these interesting tools that are being developed right now to measure the value network of the suppliers, measure the risk introduced by introducing every part, every process, and every supplier into the program, and measure what's going to happen once they launch it. Because they need to know that at this point, they have a lower risk, and they, no, they pretty much know what kind of defects could happen. Obviously, they already made a mistake once they finished the design. Because once they finish the design, you want to introduce, in some sense, some few mistakes in here. But at least the goal eventually is reduce the mistakes and reduce the risk here. OK, question? So, so is the goal to, to find, a, find a generic curve that would allow you to give some predictive value then what's going to happen to the yes, warranty so leakage? Yes, for every, every model of product that's been produced. For every model? Every model. Okay. And the curve is going to change every, every year. The 07 model might have a different curve from the 08 model. But that curve in the 08 model must obviously be better than the curve in the 07 model. Otherwise, you haven't learned from your mistakes. And, and the way to collect the data for the curve? will be standard then. Yeah, yeah. So right now they collect data about how many failures in the production line, how many failures in the testing line, how many suppliers have, haven't really done their job in terms of producing the right things, how many of them are non-conforming uh, components. So they look at a lot of failure information. But the information comes from a lot of parts of the ecosystem. Uh, so um, we... Similar things uh, we do in the semiconductor also, that's where I work. And uh, there are external factors also come into play in terms of the learning curve. Yes. So uh, in this case, other than what you see in terms of the part failures, you see the suppliers issues and you may eliminate some of them and yes. so forth. So there's a learning going on. Yes. On top of it, what are the other factors that comes into play? It could play be everything from they, they introduce a certain very nice feature, and introduce a new part for the feature. Yes. Because the part hasn't been produced before, uh, yeah, okay. they have to give it a high risk. So the, 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 and okay. that risk so is going to carry you through. Learn that. Yeah. And when they carry it through, they discover that they actually the market has changed. Yeah. They're about to launch it. But, the market has changed yes. because the consumers now want a greener car. Yes. And this particular part actually is not very green. Yes. So should they continue their launch? Yes. Should they make it a part of the newer design? and so on and so forth. So they have all these issues where at every stage they have to look at not just the criteria inside the company and the criteria of the suppliers, but also look at the consumer criteria as well and make decisions based on that. Yeah. So we should probably finish up, right? I just want to quickly finish up. Uh, I was not going to go beyond. So I just want to mention that this is an example of how risk is being used in order to evaluate performance of vehicles, performance of production. Eventually, it's performance of the whole enterprise because of the fact that enterprises now depend on suppliers, depend on dealership, depend on the network of consumers to give them information. And what I'm going to do is just quickly um, try and cl close up here. So one of the goals, again, in IBM was that when I led this team of, of, of people, 10 people, our goal was to look at networks of, of businesses. Our goal was to look at how they actually perform together. What makes sense in terms of information sharing? What is the value behind it? We also not just did analysis, we also went and built real systems to show the system is aligned properly, the right information, right processes, you actually get the best possible output in terms of improving the collaboration between the businesses and eventually the services. So the infrastructure for services itself is a different story altogether. I can spend another three, four hours on that, which is how do you use interesting web services and so on and so forth and manage information. Good. Thanks. And uh, if anybody has any questions for Dr. Ramesh, and oh, we're also online, uh, if anybody has any questions. Everybody from the online network? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, I'll just check. Yeah, no, no questions yet. All right. So, anyway, we'll, let's you. give Dr. Ramesh another hand. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.
Thank you very much.